Go for it. Everyone's ready? Yeah. yeah. Everyone online ready? All hungry online. Yeah. That's the high fun. <laughs> so appreciate everyone's time for coming to this CBD. So it's just basically an overview on what you can do to protect your system, what you find in standard systems, uh, on your applications, what you can do to protect your, your products going into, into the market, your <coughs> systems. Mm -hmm. Just a quick bio on Vexo. So Vexo has got you know, the Xbox was started out with a water treatment company, but then combined a number of different equipment, so air and separation, Dawson, so the magnetic filtration into one unit. Got over 10,000 international installs, so ranging from mainly in the UK, but in the US, uh, Asia, a lot of data center work for the Xbox, because plenums are getting smaller, so they can have a uh, all in one combined approach. Uh, but won a number of awards recognized by Visria. So <clears throat> all our products we put through uh, general um, testing with Visria uh, in terms of the air separation, what the quality of the air separation compared to the standard air and dirt separator is. Um, we've got from a number of awards of that. We've got a number of students in Luckley University doing a PhD, which are determining A, how the hydronic system is affected by water quality, but B, control. So where control comes into that. We recently just won the Queen's Award for innovation. So that was to do with the, the Xbox itself um, in terms of carbon reduction. So actual physical carbon, embedded carbon in the products, as well as embedded carbon and getting the separate items to site rather than getting one on the site. We sell the unit through BSS. So it's actually a boss product. But for the past year, it's all uh, agreement is with BSS. That's where we're, we're selling through. What I'm going to cover in this CPD is just starting up with module one, where we'll go objectives of water treatment and specification, what type of corrosion you can find in the system, how you can limit that within the system. Going on to module two, where we'll go into design considerations, types of steel, what you specified in hot form or cold form, going into controls. So uh, once your system's hydraulically efficient as possible, how you can then reduce the emissions of that system by basic controllers. Uh, plan upgrades and integration to existing circuits. So what you need to be wary of if you're tapping into an existing system. So if you've got a district heat network that you're tapping on, for an existing building and what you can take into account for that. Then finally into specifying. So when you're coming in to hand project handover, what you should be specifying to the end user in terms of the uh, water treatment companies that you're going to be specifying or uh, how you protect your equipment in the long run in terms of warranties and everything like that. So we'll be covering chilling. Systems, condenser systems, so air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps with the new equipment, LTHW or LTHW, but not medium pressure. So the export itself sits in the LTHW or chill water system. Once you go, go above the 95 degrees or the uh, MTHW going in the steam application, it's a different kind of fish. You're all engineers, so you'll know what a hydraulic flow loop system is. Um, so it's pressurized water within a, a pipe work. You generally get some form of losses in there, depending on the application itself. So if you've got district heat networks, you lose a lot more, but you generally lose about 10% of water. And the reason that we pretty much pick up on this CPD about the water loss is it's not just the water in the system, it's how you're feeding water back into the system. So you can have a clean system if you're having, if you're basically putting mains water back in the system by the by the pressurization unit you know, that's untreated or you've got basically a leak in that area you could be introducing oxygen or you could be introducing something harmful into an already clean system so the element around it, the reason that we see so much um or the reason that we need some inhibitors in the system the reason we get 
uh, slurry and sludge buildup in the systems. In the UK, we've got a heat, heating and cooling season, and a heating application is generally a breathing ground for bacteria. What you've got there, you've got bacteria loves oxygen, it loves heat, and it loves being stagnant. So if you undisturb bacteria, that bacteria then starts to, to grow. If it's got something to eat and the oxygen to basically expand. In the UK, we have the heating season where the heating will go on, uh, then it'll be cut off during the, the summer. When it's turned off during the summer, they might not circulate the water around the system for X amount of month. Um, with there, then you've got bacteria that's formed and that's just left to grow and grow and grow. When the company comes to turn the heating on, that's when they're getting call outs. It's like the busiest time of the year for the boiler. Manufacturers are getting call outs because people are putting the heating on. That slurry and sludge that's been blocking the pipe work is then causing the problems downstream. You also have the issue with your TRVs. The TRVs on your radiators, the quite small orifices. And if you don't modulate that pin on the TRV, you then have sediment buildup. And if sediments build up and it's left, it can stick. So you get a lot of people saying my radiators aren't working. It's obviously my boiler, but it could actually be the irradiator. So objectives of water treatment, when does it go right? So you maintain the system, it's in good condition, it's efficient, the system, or your um, equipment plant or plant equipment has its uh, lifespan, what it's been designed for. And you avoid conflict and misunderstanding. So I used to work for a pump manufacturer, a couple of pump manufacturers I used to work for Plosser uh, in the oil and gas industry, their backing systems. And then after that, worked for a company called Armstrong Fluid Technology. And a lot of times we've gotten sale failures and straight away the sale failures, it's, it's the pump's fault, but never really the pump's fault, it's the water quality. So if you get sediment buildup that's going across the, the mechanic, mechanical sale phase, basically rubbing on that phase, because there's a fluid between the stationary and rotating assembly part of the mechanical seal. If that rubs, there's not that uniform phase across the two, and then you get seal failure. <clears throat> and when it goes wrong, so yeah, Equipment can go down, um, unreliable operation, delays in project handover. Uh, so probably it's all worked in projects where the handover has been delayed and delayed and delayed to issues on site. Uh, part of my job is to project manager a site called Somerset House in London. So we've got the BMS at Somerset House along with the IoT solution. So we fitted smart TRVs, room sensors, um, panels within their all lower on technology and created individual control zones. And the idea is that with the building load profile of that building being so different to so many areas, so you've got hot desk in one area, cafes in the other areas, uh, estate office, the time that then them rooms have basically occupancy differs completely. But by using motion control, we can then create time schedule for say offices Monday to Friday night at five, Post-COVID, people aren't going in every day. So the only time that's, that room is going to get heat is if someone goes in between night and five Monday and Friday. So the reason I'm, we're handing over next week, uh, we still have issues with the TRVs itself. So fitting all TRVs when they put the, the heating on, where uh, the motor company that's went in, it's basically done some TRVs and some others. So uh, I know exactly what it is to put project handover delays to uh, when it's the, the equipment. And then, yeah, reputational damage. Uh, it's a huge, mm -hmm. huge one. So, when you're writing your specification for water treatment, do you have a standard specification that you send out with your jobs when you're doing post completion handovers? Yeah, we use uh, M MBS, basically. All right. The specification, yeah. yeah, yeah. They'll be pretty much covered yeah. uh, here, but yeah, um, things to look out for. So forms of contract, project constraints, methodology statements. So if you, if you need any methodology statements, we've vectors or methodology methodology statements in terms of uh, water treatment, mm -hmm. where source, uh, yeah. how often to do it. We also have the busy guidelines. So the export itself, I'll cover it in module three, but the export itself is designed to um, Visual guidelines, or there is a basically a handover guideline that you can refer to. And then bonds, warranties, and guarantees. So, where you've got water, you generally have four 
four problems, scale formation, corrosion, microbacterial growth, and fouling and sludge. <coughs> but when I was saying before about the heating and cooling season, on the left hand side, you've got a couple of plates. The bacterial growth, if it, if it basically attaches to, the, attaches to that plate, then you get a minimized heat transfer. So if you've got a delta T across it at five degrees uh, and you're trying to basically transfer heat from your primary to the secondary side to get that secondary side temperature, your boilers are going to have to work harder. Your pumps are working harder because you bought your pumps are sized to basically pump around water from the system. If you've got a, a slurry or sludge there, just extra strain on the pumps. So these are a couple of examples. So on the top left hand side, that's a new install uh, where they've just done a post uh, post flush on the system, high velocity flush. And that's just basically left over from, from install of the, the pipe work and everything on site. That would be then transferred if you didn't have your flush transferred around the system. Uh, Basically, being abrasive material. On the middle, you've got uh, it's basically under deposit corrosion. So you basically have a build up of sediment on there. You can then have oxygen that's trapped under there, and the oxygen that's trapped then becomes like a bacterial breeding ground, and that starts to eat the outside of the pump pipe. You also notice on that middle picture here, if your pipe size to 100, say 100 mil, 150 mil. Uh, and your capacity is reduced to half of that, your pumps then have to work harder to get the same flow rate. So there's more resistance there. You've got right hand side, top right hand corner, that's basically fully seized. So you get no flow through, through, through that system. So that's more than likely been a case of the sediments being built up, the heating season being, being turned off, or the heating uh, circuits being turned off, no circulation through there. And then that's just basically formed like a cross in the pipework. Left hand side is your radiators. Again, the same uh, build up on your secondary side uh, where you have magnetite. So it's like a blacky water uh, with some magnetite in there. Middle, you've got your pumps. So in there, uh, same probably side like sediment build up within there. That's then attacked the seal face or being forced against the seal face. That mechanical seal needs the, the water as a lubricant between the two. That's then forced the oh, made the mechanical seal fail. Then on the right hand side you've got build up within one of the plates themselves. So not just on the outside, you can have it within the, the place where you've got your process water run through. So keeping it in perspective, uh, we've used the analogy of the car. So you want to put dirty oil in a car, same with dirty water or untreated water in the system. The system's there to basically transfer heat around it transfer energy around the system or take energy away from the system. And if it's healthy, it should be your chill water. Same, same principle. On the left hand side, you've got just examples of biofilm. Uh, you can generally see I've got examples later where when we've installed exports and pull the filter out, so it can be like a sludgy, green sludgy substance. You have a mixture of biofilm and magnetite where it's a basically a sticky magnet and, and that's one of the worst because then it just sticks to all your magnetic elements of the system and then you've got sludge build up oh, and lime scale but i'll touch on that in a second so scaling is a massive problem uh, the problem with scaling depends on what area of the uk that your project's in but you can have a buildup of calcium within the system that calcium can then it's a bit like a tree it forms a ring and then as the amount of calcium within that system builds up, the tree has another layer and another layer. And as you're operating at the, not boiling temperatures, but like you're operating at like 60, 70 degrees, that's then baking the underneath of the, the scale itself. So then it's harder to remove. So I had a job in Canary Wharf, one of the, the banks there, uh, where they removed their pipework and their pipework capacity was re reduced to about a quarter. And that's on a bank where it's like data centers and mission critical. And that's just basically untreated water. I haven't put salts in the water or untreated it for scale. It also acts as a good uh, insulator. So when we say about heat exchangers on here, here you've got a plate heat exchanger. Between the plates, you've got scale formation. That's basically stopping heat 
been transferred or taken away from either side. So if you've got skill formation, you might notice that. Your uh, plates, so one of the, the first ones we when people say they've got an issue with the, the system, and we start a look at, are your pump seals failure? Uh, are you getting enough th differential, temperature differential across the the plate itself? And then when they we'll look at the temperatures on the plate and the uh, a lot higher than, than the one, then we're going to start looking at the plate itself. When you're looking at a project, this is how you basically work out whether you need some sort of salts or um, inhibitor of salts or uh, basically reduce the hardness of the water. So when you look at like London areas or southern island areas, it's harder water, so you'll need some sort of action plan in order to reduce the hardness of the water, or remove the calcium from the water itself. Now, just on corrosion, there's a number of corrosions I'll go through, through all of them in a second, but basically corrosion is a, a natural process. So steel wants to revert, revert back to its natural form. So it's always going to happen, but you can implement methods of inhibitors within the system to basically reduce the the rate of corrosion, basically. What makes water more corrosive? So oxygen, so untreated water in the system that's got oxygen. If you've got any leaks in the system or anything like that, oxygen in the system, low pH. So if you've got low pH levels, it might increase the, the rate. So we say between 4.5 and 7 is like a new rule. So if you're within that, um, reducing the chance of corrosion. Higher temperatures, so again, you're just adding uh, heat to the source, so allowing bacteria. So a bit like, um, oh, sorry, uh, aggressive ions in the system. So we'll go on to aluminium corrosion. If you've got calcium ion within there, or if you've got a corrosion that releases the calcium iode in the solution, that can then increase aluminium corrosion within the system if you've got any aluminium within there. Then debris, so anything left over from uh, when the project's been, uh, or pipe work on the system or anything like that, or um, anything made, untreated mains, water. So if you want to control corrosion, one must interfere with the corrosion cell, so by reducing oxygen, by air and dirt separator, the gases, uh, anything within that can remove the oxygen in the system. Stop the oxygen getting to the metal. So inhibitors basically act as a barrier between the metal and the, the water. So it stops that uh, chemical reaction and then stop the metal going to the solution, which is the same for inhibitors. But first we've got galvanic corrosion. So that's when you've got two metals that are completely apart in the uh, galvanic series. They've got cathodes. And anodes. So when you there's more than retrofit applications if you're doing a new plant room and you're connecting to all pipe work, just connect, making sure that the two types of metal uh, aren't too dissimilar on the galvanic series. If they are, you need to look at some sort of sealant between them, so PDFT or PDFT tape, Teflon, uh, just to create that barrier between the two metals reacting. General and uniform corrosion. So general corrosion, it's across the whole pipe work. So general cases when they've had no inhibitor within there. We've got no inhibitor within there. The water is just constantly interacting with the whole surface area of the pipe work. The aluminium corrosion, that is, uh, looks more like pin. And that's basically when you have, um, sorry. It's more like pitting within there. So when you look, it just attacks certain areas. Uh, that can be caused by galvanic corrosion. So where uh, you've got certain areas that are basically attacked when they've got no inhibitor solution or uh, the metal becomes cathodic rather than anodic, and then the water is, it basically attacks that uh, small part. So reducing oxygen within the system reduces the, the likelihood of corrosion within there. On the left-hand side, we that's 
busy of, um, from the Loughborough University PhD students. Uh, oh no, sorry, the Hebrew Shoe and White Paper for the Loughborough University students have mimicked this application where we worked out that the, the higher the pressure, uh, the more oxygen you can take out of the system. So that leads into the export. The export combines four equipment into one. It's more compact design, so when you've got smaller, smaller plant rooms, uh, you've only got one, one unit installed. And then if you're not sending four items to site, four items that need to be installed, just installing the one. Good. <laughs> Sorry, pit and corrosion. So similar to aluminium, uh, when there's an inconsistent inhibitor within there. So if you dose the system and you don't size the inhibitor correctly, if you put too little in, you're not going to get a uniform across the system itself. So then the air becomes anodic while the remainder becomes cathodic. And then that then reacts to the galvanic series to each other. And the water acts as like a uh, catalyst for that. You've got under deposit corrosion. So you've got corrosion that's built up in the system. If you don't flush your system out, that, that deposit basically sits on top of each other, builds up, builds up. You then have oxygen that's basically uh, trapped. The oxygen can't release. So the oxygen can't release. You can have various gases and bacteria that forms and releases the pipe work. Crevice corrosion. So within here, where you've got two parts of pipe, oh, two pipe works uh, crimped together, you can then have a gap between there. If you've got a gap between there, you basically the oxygen's then dissipated out of it, and you've got a chemical reaction within there. And because you've got a chemical reaction in there, it's just constantly uh, eating away at it, basically corroding it and making the the area weak. Got erosion corrosion. So if you have a system where you do a high velocity flush, but it's a really old system. <coughs> the pipework might have been uh, attacked by corrosion in the past. You're introducing basically a high velocity against uh, weak areas that then strips away uh, a part, part of the pipework. And then when you've got pipe joints, you can introduce the turbulent flow within there, the flow that then returns back in itself. So you increase within here the rate of corrosion itself. But cavitation and corrosion. So areas that you've got a high increase in uh, flow or high increase in pressure, hand in hand with them. So generally people talk about cavitation, like my background in pumps, generally in pumps, but it could be on your valves or anything like that. It's basically where the entry of gas is basically released and released and released. And then as the pressure increases, that um, like gas bubble basically implodes on itself. And as it floats on itself, it then releases a high amount of energy, a high amount of energy or heat that basically burns, melts away with the metal. Then if you've been on site where they've had corrosion, uh, you'll have heard it sounds like someone's put screws or something in the, in the pump, you know, rattling noise. You can normally hear it. Um, so stress corrosion cracking. So we've got tensile stress, a susceptible material, in a corrosive environment, you might be prone to this. So we see a lot of um, non-DZR brass, but this was quite prone to um, stress cracking. So now that uh, when people specify brass, it's normally DRZ brass material. So you've got tensile stress, susceptible material, corrosive environment, but then as you're operating in them higher temperatures, uh, if you add temperature within there, that then just increases the amount of stress on the material, increases the amount of stress uh, material susceptible. Then bio microbiological growth, so you can either have indirect MIC or direct MIC. Direct MIC is where a slow rail sludge basically sits on a pipework, it's not disturbed, it sticks to the pipework. Within there, you can have basically, when I was saying before about releasing the sulfate gas, that sulfate gas then starts to melt, melt the metal within there. So on the left hand side, you can see part of the pipe section with, um, where it's had a build of bacteria. The bacteria's basically formed a, a layer on there, 
has started to basically eat away at the metal underneath it. On the right hand side, this is generally what we see uh, within the Xbox itself is the sludge bacterial break and bacterial makeup. There is, so this is generally the LTHW system. You do have on chill water systems where there's a glycolic acid that can get released. And this glycolic acid is released from a bug. So we do a lot of data centers, data center work where we'll go out and do a water treatment sample. We'll take a water sample and they think they've got like 20% glycol. We'll do a test of the glycol and they've got like 5% or they've got 10, uh, 1%. We had one where they had 0.5% but we thought it was 20 and basically they're induced to a bug in the system that eats glycol. As it eats glycol, it then releases a sulfate, a gly glycolic sulfate. That glycolic sulfate then passed around the system, collects any biofilm, basically any sediment buildup, and creates this, this biofilm. That then puts extra strain in your pumps. Your pumps have to work hard at pump around the system. So with our export, we then collect this biofilm, get rid of the cartridge. Uh, replace the cartridge itself. So the effects of glycol on bacterial activity within heat transfer systems. So it's pretty much uh, we see a lot of systems that are 20%, 20% glycol, especially in data center work. Uh, but the more glycol you've got in there, uh, the less chance of um, contaminate. No, the, the more glycol you're in, the less chance of contamination within there. then it's cost. Mm -hmm. So design considerations for a clean and efficient system. So what you need to be looking at. So if you want to refer to Visual of BG 29, 2021, uh, that pretty much covers what you should be looking at. What design features need to be incorporated to facilitate the cleaning process? What design features need to be avoided? So avoiding dead legs, I'll touch on that in a second. What method of cleaning them most appropriate for the system? Do you want a high velocity flush or do you want a passive approach? Whether clean, chemical cleaning is important to the su successful operation of the system. So it's all about looking what's going to protect the system in the long run. So a general clean application, have a dynamic flush, getting rid of any uh, solid so visual guidelines recommends minimum flushes to your system. Bioside wash, this is more critical with uh, A, you underflow heating, but B, if you're getting any attachment to a new system or even a, um, an old system, if you're introducing like new boilers, anything that's been wet tested, those manufacturers of bank all units, chillers, everything will wet test the system or wet test their, their equipment. They'll dry the equipment out for them and might put it in the stores. That then gets transferred to, to site and might not be installed straight away. And if there's any amount of liquids or water that's left within there, obviously oxygen can get in there. You can then have a bacterial growth on a system like this. Get your bank oil units, get your flushing bypasses. Sorry. Within here, if you flush your system, but open out your you fan call the units after you flush the system and treat the system, you're then introducing any chemical, any bacteria that's formed within here back into a nice clean, clean system. Easiest way to do it is isolate this leg, do a bio, bio side flush through your fan call units, make sure that's clean before it's actually opened up to you, the system itself. Uh, removal of surface oxides, uh, effluents for the bio flushing, so get rid of any. Chemicals within there you don't want, uh, then corrosion inhibitor and biocide dorsant. So right then you basically put your chemicals back in, test it, make sure that your biocide levels are correct, inhibitor levels correct, not put too little or too much in, and then followed by back flushing. The design for water quality, what you should be looking to basically avoid, no dead legs. Dead legs means that there's water that's stagnant, there's water that's stagnant, there's potential for um, bacterial makeup. Circulation of all areas, I want to mention before about the, the heating and cooling season, if you're not then introducing or specifying that water circulated around the, the system, you might have potential for uh, sediment or bacteria buildup. 
treatment starts before filling. So with the export itself, we recommend put the export in or put the filtration in, the cleaning uh, method before you add the new equipment. So make sure that the systems are clean first. Flow rates do not encourage deposit or erosion. So the Vitria pushing guidelines, minimum guidelines, basically make sure that you're meeting the minimum guidelines, but you're not having an interest in a high velocity flush when it's a retrofit. fit. Pressure vessel and pressure calculations. So yeah, if you're basically oversizing equipment, um, you're basically inducing potential for air. Strain is dirt and air separation and filtration of five micron minimum with PD alarm. So you can have different levels of filters depending on the application. If it's a, an old system that's dirty, you can have a higher micron filter uh, as your clean phase. You can then reduce that to a, a maintain phase. Uh, on the smaller units, have a Dawson pot. So if you've got a really small primary circuit, school, a couple of boilers and a uh, small header, so have a uh, Dawson pot within there. Then do air pocket sun rises so you can clean them out. Flush and valves. Onto the minimum flushing velocities. So I'll send a copy of this presentation after if you want to go through it when you specify in uh, flushing velocities. So now we're looking at the water treatment side. So uh, how often you should be taking samples of the water where you should be taking samples. So, for example, if you don't want to take it on, if you've got a project that's got air, air and dirt separated, you don't want to take the, the water sample from the air and dirt separate because that's there to collect basic dirt. So it's not going to give an accurate example. We generally say across the pumps, on your, your drainage port, your pumps, say the water sample. And then how often? So you want to be taking water samples basically straight before you, you flush, post flush, of the system or post treatment in the system, and then pretty much twice a week for the first month, and then uh, once a month until six months. That way, you've got a chance for any bacteria that's formed in the system basically to work its way through. So, you've taken uh, samples of it, so you're not basically testing it straight after treatment, going away, and then any bacteria that's formed. On any equipment that's not either not opened up or has a chance to, to grow, you could have problems there. We have a Y mag solution, so to dry pockets inline strainer. So within here, it's to basically protect any equipment additionally. So if you want to protect your um, your heat exchanger or uh, fan coil units up to two inch, uh, you can have a dry pocket magnet. There's an inline strainer within there. You can take the dry pocket magnet out that then collects all the magnetite within here. That's protecting any of that from going across your strainer, blocking your strainer straight away. <laughs> Pretty much covered it before, but circulating water around the system. Unless it circulates to all part of the system, treatment will not reach parts of the system. So if you've got, if you treat the system, but you've got your Bank all the units isolated, you're then not treating that part. That's pretty much because um, itself. If water is not moving, solids will settle. So basically, yeah, circulating water when heating seasons off. <clears throat> Typically, flush and bypasses should be removed. So increasing the chance of, uh, of removing them, which are dead legs. And dosing pots should remain open in the system to avoid stagnation. So if you <coughs> basically <coughs> Your system, you close your doors, door some pots, and you've got any water in there. That water has the potential for uh, basically breed bacteria breeding ground. Then, why do you need biocides? So, you need them to prevent the buildup of biofilm. So, the one um, major one with biocide is underfloor heat. So, people who just install underfloor heat and operate that temperature that's a little bit lower. A little bit when it's at a lower temperature, the bacteria just loves it. So a biocide through there uh, eliminates that. So an in inhibitor effectiveness. So the inhibitors basically put around the system, basically attaches to your pipe work. That then became, becomes a barrier between the anode and the cathode and basically stops the, the metal from reacting with the water. 
you have too little inhibit layer on there, you're going to get a form of pit and corrosion where you've got elements of the pipework that haven't been basically protected from, from the water and the metal itself. If you've got too much within there, you're going to have bio inhibitor within your water itself. So your, your pipework will be fine, but we've got an example that's just come in this morning where the, the customer has over inhibited his system. So his, his water is like a yellow, like mucky color. Uh, and that's basically just too much uh, inhibitor within there, which and just acts. Basically, heavy, it's got a high strain in water, so it's heavy, so it's putting strain on additional equipment. So we, when you come to, to treat the water, if you are specifying treating the water, uh, you can't get test kits, right? Just basically take a sample and tell you uh, if your treatment's okay. So antifreeze, you've got monoethylene glycol and a monopropylene glycol. So monoethylene, chill water, monopropylene, you eat. Uh, so I think like the vape oil and stuff like that, they, um, they use money, monopropylene glycol. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a cost associated with it. Carbon steel, hot and cold form. So when you're specifying which carbon steel, you're working on the project itself. Uh, with hot form, it's heated, basically rolled. Cold form is basically stretched and um, rolled out. With the hot form, because you've basically induced the heat while it's being created, it's got a higher yield. Strength, so uh, it's already been it's already been put under the strains of the uh, temperature expansion and contraction. By cold form, it hasn't, which is about protecting your pipe work. So carbon steels are typically multi-standard. Supply with more than one standard to clearly show their technical delivery condition. So this is just basically standards without on cold form and Cold forms followed up to 50 degrees. So if you work in the LTHW uh, area, pretty much have to specify hot formed steel. Control philosophy. So once we've got the basic system as, as clean as possible, I also come and look at um, basically making the system as efficiently as possible. We're now working at lower temperatures, so air source heat pumps, we're getting up to like 40, 45 degrees. Uh, and then introduce some weather compensation. So rather than your boilers pumping out at 80 degrees, your boilers are pumping out at lower, lower temperature when the outdoor temperature uh, means that there's a compensation there. So with that, you're also introducing the, the potential for um, bacterial growth. And then with demand-based heating, uh, it's also the same where before you might have your boiler that fires up every day, every morning at nine o'clock in the morning, but with demand-based control or demand-based heating, your boiler might not come on for a few weeks during the, uh, it's during the summer. If you don't have a, a plan in place to then circulate that water uh, around your primary side, uh, you might introduce bacteria, which are meant for gym before. And then make a water and treat it to so via your PU. So basically you have some sort of treatment before it gets into your pressurization unit and then back into the system. Pretty much just covered that apart from so the uh, covered water treatment, yeah. So the filtration and DP alarm notification is the only one that's pretty much haven't covered. But going to um, fishery guidelines, you should have some form of uh, alarm on your filtration. So if you've got side stream filtration, you want some sort of alarm to tell you that that filter is blocked so someone can go and go filter it. Plant upgrades and integration to existing circuits. So within the on the left hand side, might not look like a huge amount of sediment within there, but you can have entry and solids within there. So you might take a water sample, have a look at it, and you, there's not it's not as clear. But if you leave that for uh, an hour after adding the inhibitor, you can start to see the, the particles form. I had one last week where you can actually you couldn't actually see any water any metallic particles within there, but I got a magnet on the side and the magnet on the side it pulled out all the magnetic particles so they were so fine. But then once you put the magnet on the side of the bottle, it all stuck to the bottle. It was quite quite chunky, but that's all within 
the water itself. And a lot of times we'll go to the site where we'll take a, a water sample. We'll leave it for about an hour. And once you leave it for an hour, you can then start to see the basically the water separating from the particles. So the particles will drop to the bottom and then you've got um, the water on the top, basically. A couple of examples of systems we've been to. Uh, we went on a, the application for export in. Within the export, you've got your magnets. Any magnet in the system collects on the magnets itself. So this is one hour after Dawson. Then went back 12 days there, collected more, and there is a biofilm with it being a shiny substance. So the metallic particles, if it's got biofilm on, it's generally like a sludgy. Um, metallic sludge. I don't know. <laughs> so if you're doing any projects where uh, there's a lot of magnetite pre present in the system, you can remove this cartridge itself because on this example that, that cartridge isn't really, it's collecting magnetite where it should be collecting bacteria. So you can run it on magnets only first without the cartridge filter to take that magnetite out. Once that magnetite is removed, then you can put your cartridge filter in and then you can take out the, the bacteria. Passive long-term clean is more effective for aging systems for upgrading. So then for about pipe work that might be a bit susceptible to uh, corrosion from high velocity flushes. A passive approach with side street filtration, you're basically taking generally five to ten percent of the system volume at one time. So over 24 hours, you're then filtering the whole whole system itself as a more refined approach. Then cleaning the filters. So within the filters, you've got a magnetic grace. Uh, you can take the caps off, take the magnets out. That whole, whole area becomes demagnetized. You can then just put the magnetic grate in there and it'll take off the magnetite. And after 12 days, that was the final system water. So we can retrofit the best place for side stream filtration units, whether it be a Unit only, or if it's a skid unit, um, is where you have the problem. So people specify the X partner job, but uh, they'll not specify if they have problems on the primary side or the secondary side. You can pipe it across existing doors and pots. So if you've got existing doors and pots, pipe it across that. We just need a differential across that X pot or the whatever side stream filtration you're using to get through the filter. Maybe let's skip to the end. All right. Module three specifying competent pre commissioning clean commissioning specialist. So when you're specifying a, a cleaning specialist, just um talk about the part of the CSA member. So, have a CSA card, or if you want the CSA website itself, uh, the list of that have been approved by CSA, uh, pretty much. So that is the person that's coming to, tr to treat us uh, knows what they do, essentially. Oh my God. So this is why it's so important. So about fifty percent of the uh, energy in the building is attributed to to HVAC. So your LTHW and your hot water creation. So when we're looking at reducing uh, carbon emissions or operating costs of a building, attacking the the portion that generates the highest amount of um, emissions is pretty much the the key. <laughs> so I mentioned before about the so that's either through the the water quality itself, not the strain in your equipment, or via the control. So when I was saying about Somerset House, uh, just controlling the plant room more efficiently, uh, whether it be your bonders rather than time schedules, operating them on weather compensation or on the secondary side, uh, creating individual control zones. 
effect of biofilm on heat transfer. So this is why it's so critical on your heat exchanges. So the amount of bio size, biofilm that is attached to one of your plates uh, and the thickness, you have a higher reduction in heat transfer. And incorrect heat measurement could lead to underpayment. So we're looking at like heat meters. So if you've got a heat meter on your uh, basic tenant pack, your landlord and tenant side, you've got a heat meter there that the pipe work has got built up the sediment, sediment you're going to have an uh, incorrect measurement of the, the heat or the water that's been hot, hot water that's been supplied. Uh, so then you're going to have complaints from tenants saying I've been overcharged for something that they haven't used. Quick overview of the exports. So we have the compact from four bar, we size them based on maximum work pressure and uh, system volume or system load. Um, but all the way up to 30 bar. In the UK, we're generally four bar to 16 bar. And you can kind of put them in areas of application. So your compacts are generally schools, leisure centres, uh, six of the bigger buildings up to seven bar. So you might have a not a skyscraper, but a block of flats, uh, resis, and then 16 bar, generally um, data centers, uh, high work and pressure systems, some, some of the bigger buildings in central London. As industry standard, we've got BG 29 2021, uh, recommends 5% of the water circulated. So we set that by the balance of valve on the export itself. When you come to install it, you've got your balance of valve here. It's got five settings, uh, so the minimum setting on there, which is on the compact 0.083. These are the second. You'd set that to the minimum, and that would just ensure that 5% of the water circulates through the system. Some some people like data centers, especially like a high rate of filtration. So they'll back that up to like five, where they'll get the, the maximum amount of filtration. And then also that the the filters monitored. So on the right hand side, you've got a PD monitor, got two PD sensors <clears throat> on the inlet and outlet of the export. That then ensures that we know that clean filters 0.2 bar on a compact, the dirty filters 0.4 bar, double the clean filter. Once the pressure differential on that export exceeds 0.4 bar, we know that the, the filter's blocked and we send an alarm locally and audibly and then to the, to the VMS itself. So frequency of sampling, busy of EG 50, 2021. 20, uh, so first two months of handover, so you need four sets of, uh, sets of results or bi-weekly. During and after cleaning procedures, so uh, you want to take one pretty much before and after, just compare. And then after any un uncontrolled water losses, so with the uncontrolled water losses, yeah, you might indicate that you've got a leak in the system. Uh, if you've got a leak in the system, could be air getting in the system if you want to take a water sample. Uh, when you've got evidence of deteriorating water quality, you want to be taking a sample. Water losses, uh, when anyone else has been on the site, so if you sub any work out, uh, if there's any subcontractors working on the project, take a water sample just to check your equipment. We've just got a couple of uh, things from Dr. Rayner, uh, who looked at the inhibitors at Loughborough University and uh, said the MSc student, but he's now a PhD student. Uh, looking at how the export basically works in the system, how effective it is in terms of how much um, sediment it can be removed, but then what the effect that has on basically the pumps in the system. But the PhD and this is the rig that was set up. So within here, you've got there and do separator. We've got a circulating pump within there. And basically you run a, a test within there to basically determine what said where the power consumption by the pump, how it's affected by um, any buildup within the system. So we've worked out that there's an increase between 12 and 23%. Uh, on the pump itself when we added some magnetite, dry magnetite in there. And that differs 
So on this system, it's a small, I think I said 1.5 kilowatt pump I've used. Uh, so it differs with how the pressure is. So if you're working at a higher pressure or your pumps are working at a high pressure, the amount of magnetite within the system that's removed by the, the magnets is increased. So when you factor that across all your primary pumps, it's a larger, larger system. And these are a couple of resources you can refer to. So mentioned PG 29, 2021. 20, um, that's how we designed the export. 50, 2021. 20, uh, that pretty much describes how you how you should treat the water. Uh, what you can specify to the, to the FM when you're handing over. So again, the CSCA, um, if you refer to the CSCA association when you are specifying you want to hand the project over to, if you want to specify it's doing the water treatment. Uh, copy that. Then sampling and grade also the grave, BS 8552. Again, it just it goes into more detail on test points in the system where you should test uh, locations uh, and at what stage. If you want any of these where you've got you've got copies of them, so we can send you any of them all if you want. If you've got a project in not in sure. We can give you some guidance. So there's a German standard VDI. Uh, it's not unless it's district energy, we don't generally see it in the UK. Uh, it's another basically a chemical free approach uh, to treatment. But we generally see it in uh district heat networks ish, which is another standard to be uh if we did get one at a project about three weeks ago where they specified VDI, that's the first time for, for a while. Then any questions? I go first. Yeah, uh, um, yeah thanks. Great. Uh, some frightening pictures there, just as I was trying to eat my sandwich at the start. <laughs> a lot of a lot, a lot of build up there, wasn't there? Jeez. Um, yeah, what what was um what jumped out at me was the frequency of water sampling. Yeah. Uh, so the B the BG fifty. So yeah. as as consultants, we you know we've got a, a self generated MBS spec. Okay. Which will mention BG fifty. Yeah. But I've personally never been involved with um, uh, looking at sample re results once a week for the first you know first. Uh, month and then up up to six months yeah. th thereafter. You know we have, obviously have contractors that look after the building for during the defects for that you know for that one year. Yeah. yeah. But I, I've got to, I, I feel our specs need to be tightened up a lot because I, I, I don't see any of this information coming back to us. Yeah, I think one of the critical things is based on the the project lens. So yeah. you're installed in different areas of the you've got a busy build build base mm -hmm. build. Uh, then you're doing if you're doing your fit out a barrier of various plant rooms. Mm -hmm. If you're then introducing, if so you put one plant room in, then you that that equipment's in, then you're going to put additional plant room uh, mm -hmm. three months down the line. If you're not treating that mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah, you're then opening up potential for bacteria to get in from there. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah so the yeah. frequency of the water sampling is just basically. So you've got a, a timeline of, yeah, we've basically finished that plant room, mm -hmm. the water sample was all right. You install the new equipment, you have done chillers are going on the roof or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. You then come to test your water again and you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. You can then work out where that problem's come from. So you've got like a timeline of, yeah, water was all right. But then between the last sample and this sample, <clears> you've got build up bacteria, then you can start to look at like the source of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's basically just protecting. Okay, them. and when, when the water samples come back to us, then um, I didn't take chemistry, yeah. but I, I use it a lot in my in my job. Yeah. Um, so making sense of these results that come back. Yeah. Are you? I take it you're around in that in that in that first year yeah. to basically say you've got a, a low pH, you've got a high I don't know high concentration of bacteria. You've got yeah. you've got this, you've got that, and it points towards. X, Y, and exactly that. Yeah. So, got a, we've just fitted a place called Broom Hall in mm -hmm. Wales, mm -hmm. uh, supplied some Xbox there. Got installed in December, and the guy I'm dealing with uh, rang yesterday and said, Oh, 
my water's still yellow. Yeah. Uh, what can we do? I said, we'll take a water sample. Because uh, he basically follows the approach down to RT. Start off with a 20 micron, down to a 5, now it's down to a 0.5. Mm. But 0.5 microns not really mm -hmm. necessary, because we recommend 5 micron. So we just took a water sample. Uh, and test it for what's in there. I've already done a quick job. Right, I had this one, so got them to put a magnet on the ball, see if there's any magnetite within there. There's no magnetite, so corrosion is that issue. And then we start to eliminate what can it be? My initial thought would be overdosing. If you put too much chemical within there, you basically it inhibits the all the pipe work, but then your wall then collects that inhibitor and it's pushing it around the system. <clears throat> Basically, like yellowy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. That would be my initial thought. And the only reason, the only way to get rid of that, you need to start diluting that or basically flush your system out. Flush your system out. Yeah, we, we get calls into jobs at all different stages. You know, it, it, it could be a new build. Uh, I'm involved in a hospital project at the moment where they've had years of corrosion with uh, thin wall a uh, mild steel yeah uh, so the, 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 they've almost uh, said that's sacrificial yeah but they put in new boiler plants and yeah. that, and now we're protecting the boiler plant with a with a with a plate yeah so we're looking after that side of them yeah uh, but then the rest of the system you just hear so much about uh, oh when it was first commissioned it was it was left stagnant for six months before we got the contract yeah and then it, it bursts and it's constantly getting topped up with fresh water yeah. and we 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 put so much dosing in it and then they're overdosing yeah uh, so yeah these chemical reports hit me and they don't particularly mean that much to me yeah. but I, thought, I can see that they're, they're well i can't see they're in red because they're in, i'm colorblind yeah. but it's very big as a highlighted where it's outside the range yeah but it'd be good to to, to bounce off someone like yeah, yourself yeah. to just say well what does this actually mean yeah, yeah. and send it and they're yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, they normally yeah, you get a clear idea if, if there's a lot of um, magnetite in the system, corrosion generally. So, yeah, what, what's your treatment plan? And then, like, yeah, I've oh, not, not got one, I've uh, got one, I've got one. It's generally with so a lot of our projects, are, yeah, rare or fit. Yeah, we get specified on new projects, but a lot of the projects when they've got existing problems, yeah, and the problem is that. A lot of the companies have FMs, and we'll go in and we'll say, mm -hmm. right, we'll have a look, and they're always the competitors, aren't they? All the FMs are competitors, and mm -hmm. they'll be there and we'll say, oh, yeah, they have blind blind here, and they, they never cleaned the system out, and yeah, yeah, yeah. true. They've not left any of the, the treatment logs or anything like that. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, we can. Yeah, good, good. Okay. Uh, I've, 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 hard, I mean, yeah. Part, part is not too happy. <laughs> <laughs> then it's fall, fall. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you.